Okay, how surge protection devices actually function? Big brush, okay? <laughs> just big brush, just concepts, how it kind of works, all right? So let's read the text here. Surge protection devices are connected in parallel with the load. Okay, we're gonna have to look at that in a second. And they typically use metal oxide baristers, and those would be semiconductors. And Brian, you might want to talk later on. And the surge protection, which is connected in parallel with the load, which is a semiconductor, it diverts the transient current and limits the voltage from a surge to the connected load. So let's see what we have here. MOVs, metal oxide baristers, function by changing their impedance from open, which means there's no current flow, to close to clamp the transient voltage and current pulses to protect the equipment from the transient. And you should have no clue what I just read on those last two slides. <laughs> Perfectly fine. <laughs> but you might want to go back again, like, okay, maybe we will go back again. All right. We have a transient that's coming in, uh, either from the outside or whatever the case may be. We get the transient going on the circuit. Let's say it's 550. This load is rated for 120 volts, RMS. Let's just say that this transient voltage is 550 volts, RMS. The standard to protect this equipment is that that voltage at the equipment for a transient condition could take 330 volts, RMS. Okay, let's just, that's the number. Somehow, I have to get this surge protection device that is connected in parallel with this 120 volts so that the surge protection device is 330 because loads in parallel have the same voltage. In order to get this to be 330 volts, this is gonna be the series portion of the circuit. That means that if we have 550 coming in, you got 330 here. That means the wire, one wire is 110 voltage drop. The other wire is 110 volts drop. You're like, well, how could you do that? We're talking about an instantaneous transient event. And the way I can get this wire to have 110 volts drop is to carry so much current. Well, how do you do that? Well, because the surge protection device can go from an open to a closed condition because it's a semiconductor. So it's going to go ahead and start becoming conductive enough so that it can create enough current to travel through this circuit so that we have 330 volts across the surge protection that's connected in parallel to the load. Brian, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I've actually got a really cool little graphic right here. So you can see that this represents the resistance of the MOV and this represents the voltage. So it starts out highly resistive and at some point when the, when the uh, voltage starts to go up, it becomes less and less and less resistive. The higher the voltage goes, it actually becomes at some point a complete conductor, but it actually responds to the voltage. So the voltage actually controls how conductive it is. It's really kind of a cool function. Exactly, and I'm, I'm struggling with saying this, but I'm gonna try to say this. Let's just assume, Tom, this is a short circuit that during the event of the short circuit, this is two wires that are touching together. While there's a short circuit and while there's current traveling in here, I take a voltmeter across these two conductors that are touching, then that voltage is going to be zero, right? Mm -hmm. At that point. Well, if the voltage is zero, if, that, if, if we had the MOV, short out to the point that the two wires of those two points are zero and then I connect these two wires to the load during that instantaneous moment condition well then we would only have zero volts here and zero volts there well we're not looking to have zero volts to the load we're looking and we can't get it all the way down so let's get it to be 330 volts here and, and Brian what you're saying is that well as that voltage goes higher Right? The yep. impedance gets lower, which means the current is going to go higher. And as the current goes higher, the voltage drop is taking place in the conductors. 
And right. while that's taking place, these MOVs, probably should get some pictures, show some MOVs. These MOVs are getting hot because they're right. trying to act in a capacity to short. So the heat that's in, these, in the surge protection devices can only take so many heating events or transient events. And so what they'll do is they'll put MOVs and start adding uh, more of them and more of them in parallel. But surge protection devices have lights on them. And they'll tell you, hey, this thing has failed because they have a configuration in there to be able to let you know that it has failed. Everything fails, but surge protection devices are going to be shunting the current, so therefore it can create a greater amount of current on the wires, resulting in greater voltage drop on the wires, which is a function of the transient. The higher the transient, the lower the impedance, the greater the current that we can achieve that voltage drop. Now, not only do you have heat at the MOVs, but because you're carrying, I don't know how many hundreds of amperes on the wire, so you can get a voltage drop of 110 volts, the wire's heating up. So we're taking this energy, we're taking this, tr and we're bringing it all the way in, and we're, we're, we're slowing it down, we're having impedance, we're, we're heating up the wire resistance, we're heating up the MOVs, so that energy be absorbed there. But something about surge protection I, I want you to realize, the National Electrical Code, Mario, tell us where it's at, sure. requires us to have surge protection at certain locations. Now, the purpose of surge protection is to protect electronic equipment. Some electronic equipment we're worried about. Smoke detectors? What else do we have? AFCIs? GFCIs? Life safety equipment. Life safety equipment. Um, and so the National Code, what's the code section on dwelling units, Mario? For, oh, for dwelling units specifically. Okay, the... the what were you going to give me? The one you were going to oh, give me. Oh, I was going to give you 242.12. Uh, okay, 242.12 is just about surge protection. Okay. It's an article, 242 on surge protection. But the code requires us in dwelling units, and in the 2020 code it started, that we need surge protection at dwelling units. And, and the purpose of that was... To, go ahead, Mario. Yeah, that, that rule, Mike, uh, for dwelling units is 230.67. says you need surge protection dwelling units... Uh, Tom, don't we need surge protection like in fire pump motors? Yeah, and life safety, life safety. Uh, article, article 500, emergency 100, systems. Emergency uh, systems. Uh, 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 article yep. 708, I'm sorry, 708. Yep. Uh, what's that called? Uh, That's your critical critical. operation power systems. In other words, listen, <laughs> we're moving more and more into electronics. Right. We're having transients coming from inside the building, loads coming on, loads cutting off. We got lightning events taking place. You got utility systems where a car hits something and all of a sudden it raises voltage up. So we have to protect the equipment. And we do that by, as that voltage comes in, absorb some of the energy in the wires, absorb some of the energy in the MOVs. It has a life limitation. And Article 242 in the code tells us what kind of surge protection device you have. And probably a good idea would be Put surge protection at the service. Yep. Put surge protection at your panel. Put surge protection at your TV. You know, surge protection, anything electronic that you're cascading because this energy that's coming in, it's gonna, you gotta just keep cutting it down and you gotta keep trying to get it. Door. And by the way, if you put surge protection, guys, does that mean that you're not gonna damage the equipment <coughs> from surge? Nope. No. no. <laughs> now, the, the, the other thing that a lot of people forget about, we're talking, you're talking about power, right? Right. There is you, you, there's surge protection that's maybe not required by the code, but you should be putting on your data lines that are coming into the house as well. Right. So that goes to your television. It goes to your VCR. <laughs> 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 your computers, right? So, you know, you can have a surge that comes in, and you can be fully protected. You can have it at your at your service, at your panel, on your receptacle strip, and, and lose your computer and go, what happened? And it was because you had it over, you didn't have your data communications. Well, we're not computer. going to get into that, but I will lead you up to when you get into grounding and bonding, get communication systems that because data is coming in from the telephone company or the cable, right. and in one spot connecting to a piece of equipment and then we had the equipment connecting to the electrical system yeah. and they both are connected outside the building yeah. well if we don't bond them together properly and ground them properly well now search protection is not even going to help you so so it's important to understand search protection even if you don't get into the details but get the idea 
that is going to protect you. So, Brian, you had something there. Oh, I just have uh, a picture here of oh. some MOVs. So that's what they look like. Big blue discs. Okay. Big and that, that's, if you take a piece of equipment apart, you know what I mean, then you're going to see... It's these not very equipment. exciting. That's all you see. <laughs> <laughs> but it's conductive as the voltage goes up, which causes the current to go up, which causes the voltage drop on the wire, which causes heat to be I squared R on the wire right. and in the MOV. And then, of course, it heats up the MOVs to the point that, well, you know what, we, we, gotta need, we need another surge protection device.